in a mana in a rare a rare and tirama no my harimai ko hala nicholson toko ingwa to po koko um te te tumu fakarai to po te fare wana ngaro taka no rera tenako to tenako to tenako to kato kira my name is helen nicholson and i'm the um acting vice chancellor the university and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this very special occasion to celebrate Leanne Parkins promotion to professor. These lectures are always a great opportunity for us to take time out and to actually listen to our amazing staff and broaden our understanding of research and of their research journey to get to where they are now. I would particularly like to welcome colleagues from across the university as well as students and friends but I'd like to give a very special welcome to Leanne's friends and family who've joined us this evening, especially her sister, Amanda Parkin, her brother-in-law, Ian Tennant, and two close friends, Rowan um, Jeffrey from Christchurch and Alison Balance from Nelson, who are with us today. And also joining us live on the live stream, Leanne's nephew, James Tennant, and Barbara Shaw, a friend from kindergarten. So it's amazing. So the, what will happen now is I'm going to just say a few words and then I'm going to hand over to um, Professor uh, Patricia Priest to formally introduce Leanne and then we will wait and listen to Leanne's story. So promotion to professor at Targo is something to be celebrated and really recognises the person's strengths in teaching, research and service. Leanne's career, like some of us here tonight, has not followed a path that has gone straight from point A to point B. And I suspect we may hear more about that, that tonight. Um, but Leanne is, is really um, a, an excellent researcher involved in a range of national and international collaborations in the area of public health. She's also an experienced teacher and research supervisor and she's contributed significantly to a variety of national agencies such as Pharmac, MedSafe, as well as providing excellent service to the university. So congratulations, Leanne, on your very well-deserved promotion to professor. And I and I know all of us here are looking forward to your lecture. So I'd now like to invite Trish to um, provide a formal welcome. Norera tenakota kato. Tēnā koutou katoa, uh, ko Trish Priest tāko ingoa, uh, ko te manukura, te wāhaka mātua mātou, hōra, te wharewānaka o tāko aho. So I'm Trish Priest, I'm the Acting Pro Vice-Chancellor of Health Sciences. Um, and my role is to welcome you to Professor Leanne Parkin's inaugural professorial lecture, uh, to provide a brief introduction to her and to outline the topic of her lecture, although I'm mainly um, doing the former, I think. Um, it gives me particular pleasure to introduce Professor Leanne Park, and I'm going to keep saying that, um, who I've known for 42 years. We were in the same second year medical class, um, although I'm not quite sure how I came to know her better than I did many of my classmates. I can't actually remember. I've always thought that given our surnames, we must have been put together in a group somewhere at some point, but I checked this afternoon and there were eight other students with surnames beginning with P between us in the alphabet, so I don't think that's the reason. Don't know what there was about the surnames beginning with P in our year. Um, Professor Parkin's lecture doesn't provide any detail of her time at medical school, so I want to add a couple of my memories of her from that time. First, I remember her as the most stylish student in the class. <laughs> And um, second, and more importantly, I have an abiding memory of when Liam was, I think, in fifth year medicine in Christchurch, and I was in fourth year, having taken a year out. And she was a key voice against the terrible practice of the time of teaching medical students how to do vaginal examinations by practicing on anesthetized women without their consent. Um, her in integrity and willingness to stand up for what was right um, vocally um, was a real inspiration to those of us who, like me, didn't have the courage to do that and coped by just not turning up to the session where we were supposed to do it. So I've always really admired Leanne's um, 
staunchness in that in that time and doing the right thing. It was one of the pleasures of returning to Dunedin for me that I got to work in an office along the corridor from Leanne and get to know her again, having not seen her for many years. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge that when I was the Head of Department of Preventive and Social Medicine, she was a huge support, especially around the COVID time when um, everything, they needed, there was a lot that needed to be done and she was a, a good, steady, um, <laughs> well-organised support. Professor Parkin, as um, Helen said, is an accomplished teacher of epidemiology and a pharmacoepidemiologist who's also worked on the broader risk factors for venous thromboembolism and on dark data linkage, as she will demonstrate in her lecture. She has strong links with important international researchers, including at Oxford in North America and Europe. Her focused persistence and careful planning has led to the development of a New Zealand pharmacoepidemiology research network. When I was head of department, I often suggested to junior staff that they go and talk to Professor Parkin about how she went about that journey to help them plan a similar trajectory. Um, she's had great success in obtaining research grants and publishing papers in very good peer-reviewed journals. What she probably won't dwell on is other aspects of her work and achievements, so to give you a bit of context, I will mention some. Professor Parkin's contribution to epidemiology uh, more broadly includes as an editor for the International Journal of Epidemiology, as a member of some I, uh, International Epidemiology Association committees, and as the president of the New Zealand branch of the Austra Australasian Epidemiology Association for a period. She's the ministerially appointed epidemiologist on the Medicines Adverse Reactions Committee of Government and has peer-reviewed programs of work for the Ministry of Health and for Pharmac. She has served as the epidemiologist on the University of Otago Human Ethics Committee for Health, a very important role as all of you who have applied for ethics approval for your research will be very aware of. I need to stop and let Professor Parkin uh, tell you about herself and her work now. Um, I'm privileged to have seen an advanced copy of the slides and it won't surprise those of you who know her that it's extremely well organised, tells a well thought through story and is very informative. I'm looking forward to the spoken version. Noreira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou, katoa. Um, <clears throat> tēnā koutou katoa, um, and thank you so much for coming along this evening, and those of you who are, who are here in person, and uh, thank you to those of you who are online, I know there's quite a few. Um, I was, uh, I found out just before Christmas of last year that I was going to be promoted to professor, and I'm going to put my glasses on, and what seemed like a disconcertingly short time after that, I received an email from the university asking me to uh, select a date for my IPL. And so I selected the latest available date and um, replied to the email to ask whether there were any guidelines regarding IPLs. And this is the response that I received. So no firm guidelines about content, uh, it's supposed to be a celebration of how I got to where I am today, and that a lot of people start by talking about their background. Now I also talked with some colleagues um, and a few were adamant that IPLs sh should focus <laughs> solely on research, while others were equally adamant that the most interesting IPLs included autobiographical elements. So this created a bit of a dilemma for me. So as a compromise, I've decided to provide a bit of autobiographical background and then I'll focus on research. Now, I'm aware that many academics move in a very orderly fashion through to professor, progressing from their bachelor's degree to um, an honours degree or postgrad diploma, and then to a master's, PhD, postdoc, and so on. Um, however, my career path has not been that tidy. I don't have a uh, master's degree, I didn't do a postdoc, and I spent quite a bit of time doing vocational medical training clinical work and other activities after completing my bachelor's degree. So I thought that my career path has really been a bit more like a braided river. And for those of you who don't know what a braided river is, here's a photograph of one that has particular significance for me, the Hakateri River. And as you can see, there are two or three 
uh, main channels that twist and turn their way along the riverbed, as well as minor channels and little backwaters. Now, one of the things about moving swiftly down one of the main channels of a braided river is that you don't get much time to look at your surroundings, and the stones in the riverbed can look, tend to look very similar and, and perhaps a little boring. But if you deviate off into one of the smaller side channels or backwaters, you actually have time to notice that the stones are really quite diverse and interesting. And as you'll see shortly, I've um, actually spent quite a bit of time in metaphorical side channels and backwaters, looking at things that really interest me. I was born and raised on the Canterbury Plains in Ashburton, which is situated on the banks of the Hakateri River. And it's also close to some other braided rivers, such as the Rangitata and the Rakaia. And these rivers all flow down from the snow-covered Alps across the plains and down to the ocean. And just as you have to go back to its source to develop a complete understanding of the life of a river, I'm going to begin the story of my academic path with my pre-university education. And so here it is. And I suppose it looks pretty standard, except that I was very fortunate to be born at the time that I was, because I was the first girl on either side of my extended family to have been given the opportunity to have more than three years of secondary school education. My mother did extremely well at school, but she wasn't given a chance to progress past the fifth form or year 11 in these terminology of today, and nor were any of my aunties. And my grandmothers had even less opportunity. They completed primary school and then they had to start working. But my parents were very determined that my sister and I would have the opportunity to finish secondary school and go on to university. Now, in terms of my tax-paying working career, um, that actually began when I was 14, when I was employed as an assistant to Father Christmas at the, um, at the farmer's co-op where my father worked. And in subsequent years, I worked in other departments at the farmers, and I had a variety of other holiday and weekend jobs, including working as a nurse aide at the rest home where my mother worked. And although my favorite subjects at school were English and history, I, my experience working at the rest home made me think about applying for medical school. But this tentative plan didn't uh, meet with the approval of the girls' careers advisor. And yes, we had separate careers advisors for girls and boys at my school at that time. Anyway, the, the careers advisor said uh, that medicine was no career for a girl. Um, and she said that since I was quite good at maths, I could be a bank teller. <laughs> and, uh, or if I wanted to really aim high, I could be a primary school teacher or a nurse. I completely ignored this advice and I went ahead and applied for medical school. And in those days, you could, uh, there were two ways of getting into Otago Medical School as a undergraduate. The first was that you could apply while you were still at school, and if you achieved high enough marks in the end of year exams, uh, you were guaranteed a position, a place at medical school, providing you passed your exams in the medical intermediate year. And if you didn't get in that way, you could uh, get in, you had a second chance by doing really well in the medical intermediate year. Um, and the, the, the first method of getting into medical school that I mentioned was preferential entry, and I was lucky enough to, to get that, and that gave me quite a lot of flexibility in my first year at university. And so as well as taking the required papers, I also took some papers on Greek and Roman literature and art and architecture, which was really great, except that um, it created a bit of a dilemma at the end of the year because I was really torn between going to medical school and doing a classical studies degree. But in the end, I went to medical school and in another piece of good fortune related to the time at which I was born, we didn't have to pay exorbitant tuition fees. Although we still had some fees and we had to buy textbooks and cover the general costs of living. But by working during the holidays, the university holidays, I was able to get through medical school almost debt free, which many students cannot do nowadays. And as well as providing wages, some of those jobs were really, really enjoyable. 
For example, I measured water flows in high country station uh, streams and rivers in what would later become the Hakateri Conservation Park. I helped to cut a new section of riverside track in what would later become the Paparoa National Park. But anyway, after six years of um, time at university, I graduated with a medical degree and then completed my first house surgeon year in the North Island in Waikato. And at the end of that year, I decided to take some time out to develop some different skills. And so I went to Nelson Polytech and I took some classes in silversmithing, woodwork and car maintenance. And I ended up uh, reconditioning the engine of the 1959 Mini that I owned at the time. After that, I uh, took a Te Reo immersion course at Whakatū Marae. And then I returned to Dunedin at, um, and took up a general health surgeon position. And during that time, I applied for a position the following year as an obstetrics and gynaecology house surgeon. However, there was a three month gap between positions, and so I spent the summer outdoors on tramping and camping trips. By the end of my appropriately nine month um, obstetric and gynaecology position, I had completed the Diploma of Obstetrics and had been accepted into the GP training programme. However, there was a um, a gap again between the end of one job and the beginning of the next and so I spent the summer outside again on tramping and camping trips. And after a year as a GP registrar I passed the college part one exam and then went on to do some GP locums. But then I had uh, the misfortune to fall off a horse on a horse trek and among other injuries, I broke my arm up, up near the top here and sustained a radial nerve palsy. And after several months with no signs of nerve recovery, I began to wonder um, what kind of medical work I could do with just one functioning arm. And so among other things, I made an appointment with um, Professor Sir David Skegg, who I remembered from medical school, had given some really, really interesting uh, lectures on ep epidemiology lectures. Um, and David talked about public health medicine as a potential option. However, the radial nerve eventually grew back and after about nine months I was able to return to clinical work and I had positions at student health here in Dunedin in general practice and at the local family planning clinic and I did that for a couple of years. And then I spent a few years working in Australia at an inner city health centre for young homeless people, sex workers and injecting drug users. And after that, I spent eight months backpacking around the UK and Western Europe and Eastern Europe and into Russia. And by this time it was 1996, so just a few years after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And in 1997 I started back at Student Health here again in Dunedin and I began a Russian degree. And the following year, 1998, I continued with those activities, but I also took a couple of postgrad public health papers, the first of which was epidemiology and biostatistics. And this brought me back into contact with um, David Ski. I also applied for the following year's intake into public health medicine, uh, the public health medicine training program. And then, as now, part one of the training consisted of completing a Master of Public Health degree. And public health registrars were actually required to start their master's research before they'd even completed the postgrad diploma of public health. However, the, it's a bit of a theme, there was a bit of a gap between one role and the next, so the public health training wasn't due to start until late February of 1999, and so I headed off to Moscow State University for a Russian language immersion experience. And when I returned to Dunedin, I continued taking postgrad public health papers and started what was to have been my master's project. But after realising that epidemiology was really the area of public health that I wanted to work in, I later applied to transfer to a PhD and I was fortunate to be awarded a Health Research Council clinical, training, uh, cl clinical research training fellowship. But I couldn't take those up immediately either. 
but this time I didn't go off tramping. Um, I couldn't take them up immediately because I had to spend some time in the local public health unit as part of my public health medicine training. Anyway, I eventually uh, got started on more research for my PhD and a bit later on I was appointed as a lecturer in epidemiology. And finally, I completed my PhD, I passed the public health medicine fellowship exam, became a fellow of the new, newly established New Zealand College of Public Health Medicine and made my way through the various academic titles. So that's an overview of how I got to where I got to today, where I am today, and hopefully you now understand why the braided river um, metaphor came to mind when I thought about my career path. Anyway, I'm going to move on now to talk about research. And just to note, some of the slides that I'll show will have images of news or journal articles, and I'm not expecting anyone to read these because I'm not going to leave them up for long enough. They're just there to provide a bit of colour and a bit of context to what I'm talking about. So I'm going to start my research story in February of 1999 with this article in New Zealand Doctor. And the pill referred to in the title is the combined oral contraceptive pill, which contains two hormones, estrogen and progestogen. And from now on, I'm just going to refer to these types of pills as oral contraceptives. And VTE is short for venous thromboembolism. And this is a collective term that includes both deep vein thrombosis, which you might have heard referred to as DVT, uh, which is a condition where blood clots form in the deep veins of the leg or the pelvis. And the second condition that comes under the VTE banner is uh, pulmonary embolism. And this is where the DVT clots or parts of them break off, travel through the bloodstream and lodge in the lungs. And along with a photo of David Skegg, you can see that the Ministry of Health has commissioned some research into deaths from venous thromboembolism among users of so-called third-generation oral contraceptives. Now, at the time that this article was published, David had already asked me whether I'd be interested in undertaking this research for my Master's of Public Health thesis. And he and Professor Charlotte Paul would be my supervisors and Professor Peter Herbison, who I understand is online, so hello Peter, um, would be the, the biostatistician on the project. And of course I had accepted this invitation. But before I actually discuss the research itself, I want to give you a quick bit of background. And to do that I need to take you back a few decades to the 1960s, the early 1960s, when case reports and descriptive studies first suggested that there might be a link between oral contraceptive use and VTE. And these publications were followed by some case control studies and then cohort studies. And I'm aware that a lot of people in the audience won't be familiar with these types of studies, so I've created some simple diagrams just to quickly illustrate the basic principles of each. So if we were to carry out a case control study to investigate whether the use of oral contraceptives was associated with a higher risk of VTE than non-use, we'd start with a defined population of women, of women of an appropriate age, in other words, women in the age group in which oral contraceptives might be used either for contraceptive or gynaecological purposes. And then we would identify all women who developed VTE during a defined period and this would be the case group. And then, from the same population, we would randomly select some controls, and these would be women who hadn't developed VTE during the same period, and this would be our control group. And then, for both cases and controls, taking exactly the same approach for both groups, we would determine whether oral contraceptives had been used before a defined index state. And then we'd calculate something called an odds ratio, which is an estimate of relative risk. And this would tell us whether or not oral contraceptive use was associated with a higher risk of VTE than non-use. In a cohort study, we'd also start with a, def um, a population of women of an appropriate age, and we'd ascertain whether they were using oral contraceptives or not. So we'd end up with two groups, users and non-users and then we'd follow them up over time and calculate the incidence of VTE in the user and non-user groups, and finally we'd calculate the relative risk. 
Now the case control and cohort studies that were undertaken back in the, the 1960s and going into the 70s found an association between oral contraceptive use and VTE. But there was debate about whether this finding was due to a causal relationship or whether there was some other explanation. And it's very appropriate whenever we find an association between an exposure and an outcome to consider potential non-causal explanations. In this instance, however, it turned out that chance, bias and confounding were unlikely explanations for the association between oral contraceptive use and VTE. And so a consensus emerged that there was a causal relationship between oral contraceptive use and VTE, and also that the risk uh, appeared to be higher with higher doses of estrogen, while the progestogen component of the pill didn't appear to be important. And since that time, the formulation of oral contraceptives has changed considerably. The dose of estrogen has been progressively lowered and new generations of progestogens have been developed. And in the 1990s, early 1990s, the so-called third generation uh, pills were introduced. And these contained one of two new progestogens, either desogestrel or gestadine. And these third generation pills were promoted as having a better cardiovascular safety profile than older low dose pills. And so it came as quite a surprise when four large and well designed studies published in late 1995 and a fifth study published in early 1996 found that women using third generation pills were about twice as likely to develop VTE as compared with women using low dose pills containing another older progestogen called levonorgestrel. And you can see that one of the studies also looked or as estimated the absolute risk of VTE. Now there was considerable debate about these findings, including debates about potential biases and confounding, about biological plausibility, the importance of any difference in risk, and other supposed benefits of third generation pills. And then some people also argued that the risk with third generation pills was nothing to worry about because after all it was a lot less than the risk associated with pregnancy. But of course that would only be a valid argument if the sole means of preventing a pregnancy was a third generation pill. And the issue of competing interests also arose, um, competing interests in relation to pharmaceutical industry funded research. For instance, data from the fifth study, which was funded by a third generation pill manufacturer, um, it was reanalyzed four times until the association went away. Now, this was all really relevant to us here in New Zealand because almost 80% in 1995, almost 80% of oral contraceptive users in this country were taking a third generation pill. And this was the highest proportionate use in the world. And one could argue that some of the morbidity and mortality from venous thromboembolism in young women might have been avoided if other low-dose pills had been used instead. In July of 1996, the Ministry of Health issued oral contraceptive prescribing advice, but this was actually weaker than the advice recommended by the Medicines Adverse Reactions Committee, and it had minimal impact on prescribing practices. So by the end of 1998, third generation pills were still being strongly advertised in the new ethical uh, catalogue that was uh, used by New Zealand doctors, and about 65% of oral contraceptive users were still taking third generation pills. But in December of that same year, MedSafe, which as you can see from the slide is New Zealand's Medicines and Medical Devices Safety Authority, uh, MedSafe reported that at least six third generation pill users had died from pulmonary embolism during a relatively short period of time. And this attracted a lot of media attention. And one of the third generation pill manufacturers quickly sent out a letter to all New Zealand doctors with this quote from one of the researchers involved with the fifth original study, the study that was reanalyzed four times. In February, uh, MedSafe re reported a further death. Meanwhile, um, I was living in student accommodation at Moscow State University without any of the forms of communication 
that we take for granted today. So there was no internet, no email, no mobile phone. So I was completely unaware that I wasn't exactly going to have a gentle introduction to research. But that became very obvious as soon as I was back in New Zealand when there was still a lot of media coverage um, and in May Medsafe reported a further two deaths amongst third generation pill users and the media coverage continu continued throughout 1999. Anyway, um, in between taking a couple of postgrad public health papers, I carried out a national case control study. And in brief, this involved obtaining ethical approval from 12 regional ethics committees. So back in those days, we didn't have multi-region ethics committees. We had to go to four, uh, 12 separate committees. Um, we requested information about potential cases from the Ministry of Health, so p women who had died from uh, pulmonary embolism. Uh, and I examined coroner's records and autopsy reports and death certificates and hospital records to determine whether the potential cases had indeed died from pulmonary embolism. And unlike today when so much is digital, this actually involved uh, me travelling all over the country um, to examine paper records. And, and I used those same records to um, find the names of the GPs and also police records because if women had died very suddenly and unexpectedly, police were often called. And if that, those methods to find the names of the GPs failed, then we wrote to the next of kin of the women who had died. And I visited all of the general practices that the women had attended and randomly selected four controls from those same practices. And I extracted medical and contraceptive histories from the GP records and also uh, any family planning records that existed for both cases and controls. And then uh, Peter Herbson and I worked on the analysis. And we published the findings of the research in June of 2000. And we found that users of any type of oral contraceptive were almost 10 times as likely to die from pulmonary embolism when compared with non-users. And you can also see that the odds ratios for users of third generation pills were almost three times that of levonorgestrel pills. Although of course the New Zealand population is small and, and fortunately fatal pulmonary embolism among young women is very rare and so the numbers in our study were quite small and the confidence intervals are therefore correspondingly very wide. Now we'd also obtained some information from the Ministry of Health about oral contraceptive um, supplies and we had used these data to estimate the absolute risk of death from pulmonary embolism in users of any type of oral contraceptive. And our estimate was higher than expected from previously reported incidents and case fatality rates. And we thought that this was, might partly reflect uh, the extensive use of third generation pills in New Zealand. Now we had shared the findings of our study with MedSafe before uh, the paper was published. So MedSafe wrote to New Zealand doctors, midwives and pharmacists at the time of publication. And it also took the opportunity to counter uh, some mis misleading and accurate and inaccurate claims that had been made in two publications. And the first of these was an article in the New Ethicals Journal, which was co-authored by a former Family Planning Association spokeswoman. And this had been widely distributed to GPs by a third generation pill manufacturer. And the second publication was a letter to the New Zealand Medical Journal by the College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. Now the publication of our paper was followed by more media coverage. But despite all of this, at the end of 2000, third generation pills were still being advertised to New Zealand doctors quite, quite strongly. And a few months later, in March of 2001, a news article in the British Medical Journal, the BMJ, revealed that a manufacturer of third generation pills had failed to publish a study that had produced unfavourable findings for their product. And a few months later, in July, a meta-analysis was published that included studies that had directly compared 
the risk of VTE in users of third generation pills versus levonorgestrel pills. And by this stage, I, I should say that many more studies had been published. And in the analysis that included all of the eligible studies, the odds ratio was 1.7. But interestingly, when the analysis was stratified by funding source, the odds ratio for industry funded studies was quite a bit lower than the odds ratio for non-industry funded studies. So that's the third, well that's all I'm going to say about the third generation pills study, uh, story. It, was a, it, it, was, it went on for a long time and it was much more complicated than what I've had time to talk about today. But anyway, the very next year there were case reports of VTE in users of an oral contraceptive containing a new progestogen called drosperinone. And you can see two quotes here, a concerned message from an author of one of the original third generation pill studies, and a statement by a manufacturer that it was absolutely convinced of the safety of its new pill. And three years later, we can see uh, two advertisements regarding the introduction of drosperinone pills into New Zealand. But at this time, there was still a lack of information about whether drosperinone pills, uh, whether these pills were associated with a similar or higher risk of VTE than levonorgestrel pills. In 2007, two industry funded studies were published that reported no difference in risk. But if you look at the methods, very carefully at the methods of these um, studies and uh, the comparisons that were made, the results are not exactly reassuring. If we fast forward a couple of years, I was lucky to be on research and study leave with Professor Susan Jick at the Boston Collaborative Drug Surveillance Program, and we initiated a study based on the UK GP research database to investigate this issue. And Susan also initiated a second study that was based on US health insurance data. And around the same time, two non-industry funded studies were published which reported a higher risk with drosperinone pills. And our studies were published in April of 2011 and we also found a higher risk with drosperinone pills. And in response to our papers, the regulators in several countries issued safety advisories. And here in New Zealand, MedSafe reiterated advice that levonorgestrel pills were associated, were associated with the lowest risk of VTE. And at the end of 2011, three further non-industry funded studies, including one that had been commissioned by the FDA after our papers were published, they reported, also reported a higher risk with drosperinone pills. And in mid-December of that same year, a BMJ news article reported that an advisory committee to the FDA had voted 21 to 5 in favour of strengthening the labels on the drosperinone pills to include more information about the possibility of, the possibility of increased risk of blood clots. But that committee had stopped short of recommending that the label should warn that drosperinone pills were more likely than other pills to cause VTE. Instead, the advisory group suggested that the labels say that the evidence about blood clots is conflicting. And then, um, the following month, a um, news article in um, January reported that several committee members who had cast votes had financial ties to drosperinone pill manufacturers. And quite a bit must have happened behind the scenes after this because in April it was reported in the BMJ that the FDA was now requiring the labels to, of, of drosperinone pills to state that they may cause as much as a threefold higher risk of blood clots than other oral contraceptives. It's also interesting to note that even before this FDA advisory committee episode, concerns had also been raised about undeclared conflicts of interest in clinical guidelines related to drosperinone pills. And one of the manufacturers of these pills had also been required to correct mislead, misleading advertising about their products. Now I've spent a lot of time talking about oral contraceptives and VTE because I think the story illustrates the complexities of the drug safety research environment. And the first point I'd like to make about this is that knowledge evolves. 
And drugs, of course, as pharmacologically active substances, inevitably have potential side effects or harms, as well as the desired benefits. And many harms, especially those that are rare or long-term or related to exposure during pregnancy, uh, won't be identified in the pre-marketing clinical trials that form the basis of the applications that manufacturers make uh, when they're submitting a, an application to the regulator when they want to get their drug licensed for use in a particular country. And randomised controlled trials are usually not an option to investigate emerging safety concerns once drugs are licensed and are being used in the general population. They're not feasible for rare or long-term uh, long harms, and also it's not ethical to randomly allocate people to take an, ex an exposure uh, that you think might be harmful. And so that leaves us with um, doing case control or cohort studies, which of course come with methodological challenges in terms of minimising bias and confounding as much as we can. Now the second point I'd like to make about the complexities of the drug safety research environment is that it's obviously important to consider the balance of benefits and harms. And the level of harm that people are willing to accept for a given benefit might differ according to the severity and the prognosis of the condition for which the drug is being used. And the final point I want to make about the complexity of this sort of research area is that, as you've seen, there are often multiple interested parties. Um, there's the users of the drugs and their family members, there's prescribers, there's health advocates, manufacturers, the, the regulators, and also sometimes lawyers. So to recap, the first stream of work related, to, uh, uh, first stream of work in my PhD related to oral contraceptives and fatal PE, and that led on to some further research following my PhD. And just in case you're starting to worry about being here all night, I'm not going to uh, cover the other streams or subsequent work in any great detail. I just want to give you a quick snapshot of some of the other work I've been involved in. And so the next stream of uh, work for my PhD involved psychotropic drugs and fatal PE. And this was prompted by a study that had found an association between current use of conventional antipsychotic drugs and non-fatal VTE. But there was a lack of information about the risk of fatal VTE. And so I carried out another national case control study to examine the association between the use of psychotropic drugs and fatal pulmonary embolism. And the findings for psychotropic drugs were consistent with studies of non-fatal VTE, but unexpectedly we found an association between antidepressant use and fatal PE. And a question that's particular to epidemiological studies of drug safety is whether a potential association between the use of a drug and an adverse event is due to the drug itself or the condition for which that drug is being used. And several years later, when I was on research and study leave with um, Professor Dame Valerie Beryl at the University of Oxford, we explored this question in relation to antidepressants and VTE using data from the Million Women study. And a few years after that, when I was on um, another research visit to Oxford, we carried out another study related to psychotropic drugs and depression. And this time, uh, we were looking to see whether an association between depression and heart attacks, which had been reported in some studies, might be explained by the use of either psychotropic drugs, residual confounding, and or reverse causation. So, coming back to my PhD again, uh, the third national uh, case control study I completed looked at long distance air travel and fatal PE. And ironically, unlike the oral contraceptive and psychotropic drug studies, I didn't need to leave Dunedin to do this study because it involved telephone interviews with next of kin of cases and with randomly selected controls from the same region as cases. And we did find an elevated risk of fatal PE with long distance flights, but the absolute risk was reassuringly low. And I didn't pursue any further research on this topic uh, following my PhD, but I did explore other risk factors for VTE with the Million Women's Study collaborators, including uh, looking at body, body mass index and the risk with VTE, both in the absence of surgery and following surgery, and the same with smoking, both in the absence of surgery and following surgery. 
And the final stream of work that arose from my PhD was in response to the logistical issues I encountered in the oral contraceptive and psychotropic drug studies. And the first of these was that I had to do a lot of travelling, and I estimated that cumulatively I was probably away from home for almost a year. And the second logistical issue was, um, well the second challenge rather, was the hazards I encountered when searching for records, because some of the records were stored in far from optimal um, conditions. And at the time I was collecting these data, uh, the Ministry of Health had s held several national health data collections, some of which you can see on this slide. And the Ministry was able to link information about individuals across most of these data sets using an, a unique patient identifier, the National Health Index, or NHI. However, it wasn't possible to link, with, uh, link these data with information about prescription drugs that had been dispensed from pharmacies because NHIs were not recorded in the pharmaceutical collection at that time. So as you can imagine, I was very excited when the Ministry did start to record NHIs in the pharmaceutical collection because this opened up huge opportunities for sort of public good research looking at drug utilisation and safety studies in a much more timely fashion than had previously been possible. Now researchers can request data extracts from these um, data collections for specific projects, providing that they have ethical approval uh, for the project and that they adhere to data protection and privacy legislation. But before we requested any data for drug safety studies, Charlotte and I decided to organise a three-day citizen's jury to find out what an informed public thought about the idea of using these data for two purposes. And the first of these was to identify potential adverse effects of drugs that were newly introduced into New Zealand. And the second purpose was to investigate emerging concerns about the adverse effects of drugs that were currently being used in New Zealand. And the jury unanimously uh, supported both types of activity, provided that um, ethical guidelines were followed, relevant laws were adhered to, and privacy was protected. So we were then ready to carry out some studies, some drug safety studies, using these data, and following input from a advisory committee, we decided to do two studies related to issues that have been the subject of recent MedSafe warnings, safety warnings. And the first study related to um, a question about a very widely used cholesterol-lowering drug called simvastatin, and whether the risk of uh, a potentially fatal condition called rhabdomyolysis differed according to the doses of simvastatin that were recommended in the cardiovas cardiovascular uh, disease prevention guidelines that were current at that time. And the second study related to a question about um, a widely used group of drugs called proton pump inhibitors, or PPIs, and these are used to treat or, or prevent uh, gastric acid-related disorders. And the question here was whether these drugs increase the risk of an acute kidney disorder called interstitial nephritis. Anyway, we completed the simvastatin study, and that led on to further studies with other researchers and two medical students, um, Josh Kwan and Finn Sigelkal. And these studies um, investigated other topical statin-related uh, safety and utilisation issues. And for the PPI study, Charlotte and I were, um, had the good fortune to supervise Maylin Blank um, to undertake this project for her Masters of Public Health degree. And as with the simvastatin study, the PPI study led on to some further research. Now, following the completion of the first simvastatin study and PPI study, um, in 2014, a small group of us were awarded um, some strategic initiative funding to establish a pharmacoepidemiology research network. And the current members of the core academic group of the network are shown here, so Simon Horsburgh, um, Katrina Sharples, um, Sarah Donald, Jimmy Zeng, Dave Barson, Michael Tatley, Jack Dummer, and Karen McLennan. And as well as carrying out research and supervising students, we also run an annual symposium, which 
in the last few years has been sponsored by MedSafe and Pharmac, and it's usually attended by members, staff from those agencies, as well as uh, clinicians and researchers and students. And over the years, we've had keynote speakers from a variety of countries, including Canada, the US, um, Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, the UK, and Australia. And as far as our research goes, some of our work has focused on the drug treatment of two health conditions of public health importance in New Zealand, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, and type 2 diabetes. And some of our work has also focused on uh, the use and safety of drugs during pregnancy. Now the first stream of work came about, came about when um, Jack Dummer, who's a respiratory physician, approached me with several questions related to the treatment of people with COPD, including how well international COPD prescribing guidelines were being followed in New Zealand, whether the use of two long-acting bronchodilator drugs was associated with a higher risk of heart attacks and unstable angina than, just, uh, than the use of just one drug. It was in the first study we did, but we were a bit concerned about the potential for residual confounding because the Ministry of Health data sets didn't have information about all of the uh, risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So we formed a collaboration with uh, Professor Rod Jackson from the University of Auckland and completed a study based on his cardiovascular predict cohort, which has very detailed information about cardiovascular risk factors. And again, we found an association. And Josh Kwan came back for a second summer research experience and we looked at whether people with COPD received beta blockers as is recommended following uh, an acute coronary event. Um, and also I was then subsequently lucky enough to spend a few weeks in Canada with Professor Tara Gomes at the, the Ontario Drug Policy Research Network. And we looked to see whether the introduction of combined inhalers that included two long-acting bronchodilator drugs had led to an overall increase in the use of two rather than one of these drugs in Ontario. As far as the type 2 diabetes work goes, we've carried out a series of studies related to the use of metformin for type 2 diabetes, including looking at adherence, uh, patterns of discontinuation and reinitiation, the experiences of people taking metformin, and with another med student, uh, Joyce uh, Gore, we looked at treatment pathways. And just moving on now to drugs in pregnancy, I mentioned earlier that uh, when we don't know a lot about the safety of medicines in pregnancy when drugs are first licensed for use in the general population. And this is because pregnant women are generally excluded from the pre-marketing clinical trials. So I wondered whether the Ministry of Health national collections could be used to investigate the utilisation and safety of drugs during pregnancy. And we were very fortunate to recruit Sarah Donald, uh, who was just finishing her public health medicine training, to explore this and other questions as part of her PhD. And Sarah was awarded a health research, clinical research training fellowship. And she did a huge amount of work with Dave Barson, our data manager, to create the New Zealand Pregnancy Cohort and Linked Baby Cohort. And I'd just like to note that because the Ministry of Health data are not collected for specific research purposes, uh, studies based on these data are very data management intensive. But anyway, the uh, New Zealand Pregnancy Cohort originally included almost a million uh, pregnancies, including early losses, and after a recent update, it now includes about 1.5 million. And the data from the pregnancy cohort are linked to some of the other um, data sets that are held by the Ministry of Health, and the same for the baby cohort. So Sarah has, um, using these inf this information, she's described the overall patterns of various prescription drugs in relation to pregnancy. She's also focused on drugs that have the potential for fetal harm. And she's also looked at the patterns of antidepressant dispensing in relation to pregnancy, um, and also examined uh, the safety of antidepressants, <coughs> depressant use during pregnancy. And the creation of the pregnancy cohort has also led to other important public health research, such as this master's project 
uh, by a public health medicine registrar, Andrew Sais, who's online as well, um, which looked at whether women with gestational diabetes are, re are receiving the recommended screening for type 2 diabetes following their pregnancy. And finally, I just want to give you a very quick snapshot of some of our current projects. And several of these are based on the New Zealand pregnancy cohort and baby cohorts, including a project investigating the use and safety of an anti-nausea drug called Ondansetron. Um, and this drug was originally developed to treat nausea and vomiting in people receiving chemotherapy, but it's increasingly being used during pregnancy, even though it's not licensed for such use. Sarah and I also have some international collaborations, including looking at the utilisation and safety of smoking cessation drugs in pregnancy, the use of prescription opioids in pregnancy, and the use of lithium and other psychotropic drugs in pregnancy. And some of us are also building on the work I did with the Ontario Drug Policy Research Network. So that's an overview of my academic career to date. And to return to the braided river metaphor, I'm hoping that I still have some time to explore yet more interesting research channels before I encounter the pounding waves at the river mouth. And I'm just going to finish off very quickly with some acknowledgements. And you can see that there are so many people to thank, but I particularly want to thank David Skegg and Charlotte Paul uh, for inspiring me to embark upon a career in epidemiology. Thanks also to the many people and organisations who facilitated access to the information that was needed to undertake the various research projects, and also to the various funders who've supported the research. And most of all, my profound thanks to my parents, who made it possible for me not only to finish secondary school, but also to attend university. So no rera, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. I'm Charlotte Paul, I'm a supervisor, a colleague, friend of Leanne's. Um, that was just wonderful, Leanne. Um, I'm honoured to be invited to thank you. I felt it was absolutely the right balance of the personal and the work, so I'm obviously one of the people who thought she should say quite a lot about her work. Um, um, I want to acknowledge especially your father, who you cared for with such an open heart for so long and who died earlier this year, as you, did your sister, who's here tonight. Um, the braided river metaphor reminds me of the Robert Frost poem, The Road Not Taken. You took the road less travelled um, that led to pharmacoepidemiology, but other roads would have led to classics, Russian literature, um, Māori, or being a tradie, I think. <laughs> um, it led uh, Professor Parkin, uh, as it had for me, to work with Professor David Skegg, whose sharp mind, very good judgment and unwavering attention to the common good and to details and big things, um, set Leanne on a path to become the national leader in research on the safety of medicines. Leanne is the founding lead investigator of the National Pharmacoepidemiology Research Network and has fruitful international collaborations around the world, as you heard tonight. In fact, you've just been doing such an amazing amount of work. I, I think it was a good thing I retired quite a long time ago. Um, uh, and, and, and gradually, of course, it came that Leanne was, was my teacher um, while I continued to work with her. I looked up a definition of what I want to call our discipline, and a simple one, the study in real condition, conditions on large populations of the use, effectiveness, and harms of medicines. And you're doing all those things, actually, a lot of stuff on use as well as looking at, at um, harms. As the use of medicines increases, so does the potential for iatrogenic harm. And this was well illustrated in the study 
of oral contraceptives and deaths from pulmonary embolism. This confirmed the harm of so-called third generation pills. Public policy advice followed a rapid drop in prescribing these pills and lives saved. So the way is really as simple as Professor Parkin outlined. Well, actually, you outlined some of the difficulties as well um, as it being the straightforward thing. Um, in my experience, um, Professor Parkin has the authority and calm demeanour to be able to confront bad science and vested interests, and she has inspired many others to do this work too. So my task is to thank you for a terrific lecture and for the work you continue to do. I'm honoured to give you this, oh, sorry, I better get it. I'm honoured <laughs> to give you this small token of appreciation from the university. Right, me again, very briefly, just to um, in a moment invite you all to uh, thank Leanne again and celebrate her um, professorialness and her um, work and long may it continue and then to um, come over to the staff club for some um, refreshments to continue the celebration. Thanks. <laughs>